Hello, this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the Deepcore CH560 Digital WH. This is an in-depth build guide where I'm going to be showing you how to set up this case in a variety of ways and talking about the features and highlights of it and showing you the things to do to build in it. Now, this is a really nice case that comes with four pre-installed fans and plenty of options. Here, for example, I'm showing you how you can vertical mount your GPU using an air tower cooler, or alternatively, you can mount a 360mm all-in-one cooler to the top of the case, or indeed to the front as well. So you do have a variety of options in there with some interesting implications, which I'll get to later on. There are other things to bear in mind as well, not just the digital screen, but also there's a space for mounting extra fans at the bottom above the PSU shroud. Now this is a really nice case, and for the money you're actually getting some really awesome things with it. It comes with four fans as standard, three 140mm RGB fans on the front, and then one 120mm RGB fan at the rear. And those fans are all wired up and ready to plug in as well, and fairly easy to connect. So I'm going to show you that later on. I'm going to start by showing you the various different aspects of the case and things to keep in mind while building in it. Then I'm going to go into an in-depth build on each of the different parts. I'll leave timestamps down below so you can leap to the various bits that you need if you want to get straight into it or you need to find out something specific. Now this is a good airflow case. You can see there's plenty of venting both on the side panel with the glass and on the front and the top as well. There are some magnetic dust filters on the top and on the PSU area as well, so that's pretty nice. At the rear you have a removable door which has a couple of thumb screws that hold it in place and then it pulls away. There's a reasonable amount of space there, as I'll show you later on. And you'll see a lot of wires when you first pull that off. And some of them are already set up for you. But there's a bundle down the bottom here, which are all cable tied together, that you'll need to work out where they're going to go. And I'm going to show you that later on. But on the left hand side, you'll see a lot of white cables that are already connected up. And that's both the RGB lighting and the fan lighting for those front fans and the rear one as well. There's also a controller at the top here, and that's actually for the RGB controls. So you can see that basically this is connected to that top LED button. So when it's properly wired in, you can then press that button and change between the various lighting. So you can see here, for example, what that looks like. And there's a few different options in here where basically the lights revolve around, or you can change into a static color and go through those but you need to make sure this button is wired up properly there is an alternative where you can connect the wire to your motherboard instead so you can sync with your rgb lighting software from your motherboard but the standard setup as it's wired is to make that button work so that you can change the lighting on there but it doesn't control power so it's not a fan power controller it's just for rgb now the glass side panel is actually held in place with just a magnetic clip on the side there so you have to tug it towards you and then lift it up and that's actually pretty stable and secure from what I've seen, so that's quite nice. Once you get inside there, obviously you can see the display, but you'll also see there is a anti-sag mount on the right-hand side there that will allow you to support your graphics card, which is a nice addition, as well as some nice channeling for your cables, which is actually pretty easy to manage too. The front panel will also pull off, and you can see the mesh under there, so you have to tug that from the bottom in order to get it off, and then you can access the three 140 millimeter fans. Now you don't need to take that off necessarily if you're just going to leave the fans as standard. I just want to show you how to do that and how to access those. I'm also going to show you how to remove them as well because they're mounted to a tray that you can take off if you need to, which is actually fairly interesting because that's not directly mounted to the case, which then means, as I'll show you later on, that you can mount the radiator there as well. So some interesting highlights to this case potentially almost immediately. And those are pretty large 140 millimeter fans as well. So it'll give you good cooling performance. So now we've stripped it down, you can see what that looks like from several different angles. Lots of airflow potential in here and a really nice setup. It also has that little display that we're obviously gonna have to set up and wire in too. Now in terms of the RGB lighting, as I said, these cables are all set up and ready to go. As standard, you've got the cables connected to that controller at the top, but you can unplug them from it. So you can see that you can unplug the RGB connector from there. And there's an extension cable included in the box in a little bag, which you can plug in there instead. And this is a five volt extension cable for RGB connector. So if you want to connect it to your motherboard, you'd run that cable then 
to your motherboard and look for a three pin five volt RGB connector. This one's marked JARGB V2, for example, on the motherboard that I'm using. Plug that in and then you can control it with your motherboard lighting software like MSI Mystic Light, for example. You also have obviously a fan cable, which is done for the power that you'll need to connect to the system fan headers or chassis fan headers on your motherboard and that will then power all four fans. It's worth noting that the RGB and fan power connections are daisy chained together. So the RGB connectors are all looped together and then one connection goes to the controller. The fan power is the same. So all four fans are connected into one control cable that then plugs into your motherboard. I find that a bit worrying because usually you wouldn't want to connect more than say two to each system fan header which is something to bear in mind. The digital display at the bottom of the case is obviously used for giving you a readout and this needs to be connected separately by a USB cable, which runs from that to then to your motherboard to the bottom middle of the motherboard. Now I actually had an issue with mine where one of the cables was loose that I'm trying to fix. So a bit problematic there and that USB connection but hopefully yours will be fine. Now I'm gonna get into the setup of the motherboard and the installation of those parts. So if you know all that, you can skip forward with the timestamps, but I'm gonna go into some depth on the various different things here. This is the MSI Z790 Edge Max Ti Wi-Fi. And I've done a video on this before and reviewed it as well as the MP600 Elite, which I'm using in this build. And I'll quickly show you some NVMe SSD setups because they are worth using. They're much faster than SSDs and hard disk drives, and they're really easy to install too. So in most cases, you'd remove the covering and the heat shielding from the top of the motherboard. You can see the Strix motherboard here that required a screw, for example, and then just slot your drive in. The top slot usually gives you the fastest speeds with some implications, and I'll link to the video that I've done on that in the description. But if you can, you should replace the heat shielding back on top I can't with this Corsair drive because it has its own heat shield, but those are important because they do help to dissipate the heat and keep your drive running cool and therefore more effectively and at the right speed. Installation of your CPU is fairly straightforward. In this case, I'm using the i9-13900K. Remove the hatch, gently put the CPU down in place, taking care not to damage any of the pins. For the RAM, you want to make sure you're using slots A2 and B2, which is the second slot and the fourth slot, which might seem illogical, but on most modern motherboards, that's the setup that you'll need to use. Now for wiring your front panel connections that I showed you earlier on, we've got your type USB-C, and that's the smaller cable here that you can see plugs into the right-hand side. And then you've got a type A USB, which is a flat connector. You'll notice there's a little notch on that, and that plugs in on the right-hand side as well. You've got to make sure you line that notch up and plug those in. Now for the power connectors, there's only actually two power connectors on this case, the power switch and hard disk drive LED indicators. So there's two connectors there, you'll notice one has a plus symbol on it, and on the rear of those, they've got a little arrow that indicates the positive area as well. We're looking for the front panel connector, which is usually on the bottom right, and then you need to refer to your motherboard manual to see where things go and how they plug in. So you can see on this motherboard, for example, the power switch plugs in the top right of that connector and the hard disk drive LED connector plugs in the bottom left. Face it this way around and then slot that into the power switch connector. That will obviously make sure your computer can turn on. And then the hard disk drive LED clicks into the bottom one. Again, that's on this motherboard. It's worth checking your manual. We then have other connectors including the front panel audio connector, which you can see is J-Audio 1 down the bottom left here. That ensures your 3.5 millimeter connector will work. And you want to plug that in down there as well. It can only go in one way. You'll notice one of the pins is missing on that, so you can't plug it in wrong. Now, in terms of setting up your power supply, I want to show you all the different cables you're going to need for this. I'm using the Colink regulator power supply unit for this one. So this is the 24 pin power connector which plugs in in the top left. So this is an important one because this powers your motherboard on. So it plugs in the right-hand side of the motherboard and it's essential that you connect this up fully so it's fully seated in and clipped in. Now I'm showing you this outside the case so you can see it really easily. You wouldn't actually plug these cables into the motherboard until it's fully installed in the case. The other ones you need are the eight pin CPU power connectors. This motherboard requires two of those and most will and I would recommend plugging them in you look for the CPU slash PCIe power connectors 
on the power supply. We want the CPU ones, and then we plug one end into the power supply unit, and then the other end goes into the top left of the motherboard. All three of these connectors, so the 24 pin and the two 8 pin power connectors, ensures that the motherboard and the CPU get enough power. This is really important for overclocking, but also just for general use. If you have any issues, it might well be you've not plugged the cables in properly, or you've not plugged them all in. I get a lot of people asking whether they should plug them in, and my answer is yes. If you have them, put them in, and that will make sure your PC is powered correctly. But that 24 pin one on the right hand side is the most important. If that's not seated properly, your computer will not turn on. Next up, we've got the SATA power connection, which is this flat connector. Now, this is used for hard disk drives and SSDs, but it also is important for that RGB controller that I showed you earlier on in the case. So you need to make sure you've got one of these plugged in as well, even if you're not using drives. This is a SATA connector, so we're looking for SATA on the power supply unit. So you plug that in on the one end, and then you've got a daisy chain cable with multiple SATA connectors on it throughout the cable. You can use that to plug in your drive. So for example, this crucial 2.5 inch SSD can be connected up power wise to this connector. And then you can plug another one in and also that RGB controller. And I'll show you more on that in a second. But you can plug in multiple things to this single cable. And you can use more than one of these cables if you have multiple different devices. This case is able to take two 2.5 inch SSDs and two 3.5 inch hard disk drives. So you could use that cable and then another one separately for the RGB controller, for example. So some things to bear in mind. And then you've got the data cables, which should be included with your motherboard, which connect up to the drive. And then on the right hand side to the motherboard, they plug in there and that will then ensure that you can access those drives when you need to. So again, this wiring is all outside the case, just so it's really obvious for you and you can see what plugs in where and work out what you need to do with those. You wouldn't actually do it until you fully installed everything in the case, but I want it to be really clear for you. So that's the end result of what you do with the drives and the power for them to make sure they're all set up. Now for your graphics card, I'm quickly going to show you the 3090 that I'm using in this, and then I'm going to go into a 40 series NVIDIA graphics card as well. We're looking for the PCIe power cables, and they're clearly marked PCIe, and they come with this power supply. I will note that other power supplies have a similar logic, so this is fairly straightforward if you've got a modular power supply unit. You'll often find some that have this pigtail effect on them in the, your power supply box. I'd recommend not using those and use the single connector where possible. We're looking for the PCIe power connection options on the power supply unit and then you want that single power connector. So one end is one connector that goes to the power supply and the other end is one that goes to the graphics card. If you use those separately, then you'll get the maximum power for your GPU and ensures it runs properly. So what we want to do is basically connect two of those up in this instance, because this 3090 requires two of those power cables connected to the power supply and then to the GPU, and then that would plug in on there. Now obviously graphics cards are going to vary. You might have a GPU that only requires one connection. Maybe it requires three. If you've got a newer GPU like the 40 series, you might require four of them even. But these eight pin power connections as standard just slot into place and there's a little hook on top that you can see. You do need to make sure they're pushed all the way in though. You'll notice that one on the left, for example, isn't fully seated. So you do need to make sure that it's pushed all the way in and clipped into place. If you don't do that, you might find your GPU doesn't work properly. You don't get a display on your monitor or that you have problems with your frame dropping and things like that. So both ends have to be properly seated into the graphics card and into the power supply. Again, do this when it's fully installed. Now, if you do have a GPU that requires an extra one, you can use that pigtail cable and then you'd have three power connectors on there or maybe even four as one option, but this one only requires two connectors, so that's what we're doing for the moment. Next up is NVIDIA's 40 series graphics cards, which may require an adapter in your box, or alternatively, if you've got a power supply like this, you might have a 600 watt, 12 volt high power cable, which gives you two connectors on either end. One for this new 40 series system, which has that extra pin set up on top, and then one that plugs directly into the motherboard. This makes life a lot easier if you have this sort of power supply, you can also get these cables from Corsair, for example. So if you've got a Corsair 
PSU, you can use this as an option. It plugs in on one end and on the other end to make sure it's fully seated on both and it's really straightforward. You don't need that horrible adapter that comes with your graphics card. You could just use that single cable instead. If you want to use the adapter, you'd use multiples of the 8-pin PCIe power cables I just showed you with the 30 series card. Plug those into the power supply and then plug them into the adapter and that's how you'd set that up but this makes life a lot more straightforward as you can see the important thing with the 40 series though as you may well know is that you do need to make sure the cables are fully seated both at the power supply end and in the graphics card because if you don't seat them in especially if you've got a high-end system you may find that there is an issue with the cable melting and causing problems this is a known issue so you do have to make sure it's seated in there fully but you can see a pretty straightforward connection if you're using this sort of 12 volt high power cable just makes life a lot easier and cleaner in the build as well. So my recommendation is to make sure you know what cables you're going to be using for your power supply and connecting up to your computer before you go about building. So then plug them all into the power supply unit before you put it in the case it makes life a lot more straightforward. Now mounting the motherboard is pretty simple and I'm going to quickly show you the setup because I want to demonstrate the different things that you can do with it. And then I'm going to revisit this because I'm not quite finished with the motherboard setup yet because I'm going to be mounting a cooler on it in a little while. But what I wanted to demonstrate is the options. So for this build, I'm using an air tower cooler, but I want to show the possibilities of mounting a 360 mil radiator. So you can see that in theory, the specs show that you can mount a 360 mil radiator on the top of the case. As you can see, I'm having some problems with it. It's not easy to get in, and that's because of the rear fan. So that rear RGB fan, you may well have to take it out if you want to put a 360 mil all-in-one cooler on top. You're going to have to remove that, which obviously means unscrewing it and detaching it from the wiring that it's already set up into. And then we're going to seat the AIO in there. Now, still, you have to put it in at an angle in order to get it in, but then once that's done, you can obviously set it up and connect it up there now one of the things i did find is that there's still enough space behind it and above it to be able to access the power cables and the connections for things like the cpu or aio pump headers on there so that's a bonus and obviously you've got the holes at the top here where you can run the cables from the cooler as well and from the fans so you can neaten things up nicely just bear in mind you do need to remove that rear fan and it may be a bit fiddly to get in i've done a guide separately on the best place to mount your all-in-one cooler and this might not necessarily be the best place because what we're doing here is exhausting air through and out the top but it is one of the options so you have an option to mount a 360 mil cooler to the top here or you can mount one to the front as i've shown you you can see it will screw into the top with the multiple screws required for it and there's still a decent amount of space there and obviously that mesh paneling means you get some good airflow now i've chosen to put the tubes from the aio on the left hand side here so they're not interfering with anything and they're fairly neat you could put it on the other side there's no issues necessarily there it's going to depend on the cooler this one has some interesting tubes which you can angle differently as they're coming out of the radiator so this is the Lee Lee galahad 2 lcd which i've actually swapped with deep cool fans just to keep a deep cool theme going on here but you can see that you can maneuver both the tubes coming out of the pump head and out of the radiator so you can put them into position you might have a different setup that might be a bit more fiddly but that's how you'd set that up and then you can still access the aio pump header as you can see me doing here plugging that cable into the top of the motherboard so it's pretty easy to do that if you want to the other option as i said is to instead front mount it so you'll notice there's a gap down the bottom front of the case where you can do that we'll get to that in a second but here you can see what it might look like if you top mount that and obviously what's happening here is we've got three intake fans on the front so the 340 mil fans pulling cold air in from the front of the case and then the three fans on the radiator exhausting the air out of the top you'll have some natural passive exhaust as well with the holes at the rear of the case where the fan used to be and down the bottom around there so you should have some reasonable airflow still happening anyway but that is a basic setup that you could do especially if you're running a mid-range cpu but what you can see here is with the tubes on the left hand side you can't get that fan back in so there's no 120 mil fan at the rear anymore now i mentioned earlier on that you can remove the front fans what you'll see is they're actually held in place with four screws to the front of the case 
And this is a tray, essentially, that the fans are attached to. So if you remove those screws, you'll then see that you can then remove that tray. Pretty interesting design because rather than the fans being mounted directly to the case, which they could have been, they're mounted to a tray that's then mounted to the case. Underneath there, you can see that there is room to be able to put in other things, which obviously includes a radiator or alternatively other fans if you wanted to. So if we keep those fans on the front, we can then also mount the radiator to the case on the front there. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say this is the best way of doing it, but if you wanted to do a push-pull setup, you could put three fans on the front and then three fans on the radiator. So you could potentially have six 120 mil fans mounted on here. You can see that I managed to get it so that the tubes are at the top fairly easily, but you will have problems if you wanted to put your tubes at the bottom because you can see that just doesn't work here in this instance. It is not enough space, but it's going to vary depending on your cooler because it's quite hard bits coming out of there on those adjustable tubes on the radiator on this one. So you'd line that up like this and then screw it in. Now one thing to note is I've obviously got the fans facing the wrong way around now because as they are in this moment, they're actually set to exhaust. So what I would be doing is you've got two sets of fans fighting each other. You've got one pulling cold air in from the front and then one's trying to force air out the other way. So you'd want to flip the fans round to make sure that they're both facing the same direction on there and also you've got different fans that spin at different speeds with all them on coolers where you have a push-pull setup i'd recommend using fans that are the same on both sides so you've got good airflow because you'll have the same airflow speeds cfm and other things to make sure you've got good cooling there but you can see it is possible to do so you can indeed put a radiator on there still have fans on the front as well there's plenty of room for that and then you can run the cables through. Now, I'm putting the cables for the fans through the main gap here. I wouldn't necessarily do this. You could actually run them down to the bottom of the case. You can see there's space down there in the hole below where I put the radiator. You could hide them away a bit more neatly. I was just temporarily quickly showing you that it is possible to do this in this setup and still get a 3090 in there. So you can see there's still space for a 3090, which is fairly long. So a decent amount of room there. If you've got one of the longer 40 series graphics cards, you might have problems. I'll leave the specs in the description of how much the case can take in that regard. But this is one of the potential options that you can do. And actually it would probably keep your CPU nice and cool. And you've still got space at the top as well to add in some extra cases fans if you wanted to. The other thing that you can do in this case is you can mount two 120 millimeter fans to the bottom tray above the PSU shroud. Now I've put these in face down so that they actually pull cold air in from below and then blow it straight onto the graphics card. There are some long screws included with the case in that little bag that you'd use to secure these to the bottom and then you'd need to plug them into your motherboard. Now these are an additional purchase because they're not included as standard with the case. You do have to source your own 120 millimeter fans for this which is why I've got different ones from what are included, but you can mount them down there. Now I question whether there's any point to doing this because your power supply will be underneath one of those fans, blocking most of the airflow to it. The second one, the one on the right hand side, might well be okay in terms of the airflow, but something to bear in mind. Now a quick look at the screws that you're gonna need for this build. These are the motherboard screws that you can see here with a little round top on them. Now these are obviously labeled in the manual as well. These are the PSU ones you'll find included here. And then these are for the SSD mounting. So these are actually interesting screws that screw directly into your SSDs. Then we have some standoffs, additional ones, and a tool for that. These will be needed if you're using an EATX motherboard, for example. These are the long screws that I just used on the 120 millimeter fans that mounted to the bottom of the case. And then you have additional fan screws and screws for screwing in the hard disk drives as well. Now these are all labeled in the little manual that's included in there, but I thought I'd just give you a quick view of those. So now I'm gonna show you the installation of SSDs. So you go about screwing in those little silver screws that I showed you a minute ago. So these are essentially little standoffs. They screw into the four corners of your SSDs and then they have a screw hole on top that you need to screw in to fully tighten it in and then they just seat into the back of the case and they're really easy to install actually and this makes life really straightforward and simple much easier than hard disk drive because you're basically just mounting those in there 
And again, I'm just using these crucial drives for that. And what you then have to do is basically push them into the rubber socketing on the rear here. Make sure you face the cables down towards the bottom. So that's where the cable is going to be. You can then keep your things nice and neat there. But you can install two SSDs like that really easily to the back of the case. And then plug in the cables that I showed you earlier on. So the data cable for each of them and the SATA power cable when the power supply is mounted as well. So as a reminder, that plugs in on the right hand side of your motherboard when that's fully installed. You need to make sure that both cables are connected up to the drive in order to power it and to get that data transferred over to your system and be able to use it. For the installation of hard disk drives, you also have a cage down the bottom of here where you can mount two hard disk drives. One goes inside and one can potentially go on top. I'm just going to assume you're only going to use one, so I'm going to show you the logic for that. The cage itself needs to be removed from the case. There are two screws that hold it in place underneath, and then you just slide it out. You will notice there's actually two points where you can mount it, so you can actually choose it to shift it more to the left towards the front of the case. Again, you can see the kit contents of the case here. We're looking for the hard disk drive screws, which have a kind of flat top. There's actually 12 of them included in here. So we need to dig out some in order to be able to use them in this. Now this thing will slot into the drive cage and then you're screwing it in from the side. So you should find there are multiple screw holes on the side of your hard disk drive. So you slot the drive in there and then you use those screws to secure it into the cage and then obviously put the cage back and secure that to the bottom of the case. There are six holes that you need to screw in here. So you've got six to line up and then screw in. Make sure you face the drive the right way around so that you can access the cables, obviously. So think about that when you're taking it out, which way around that's going to be because you're seating the drive in a way where you can easily plug in the power cables and the data cables. The same logic as with the SSDs as a small data cable and then the flat SATA power connection. So you can slot that in back in where it was or you have the option to move it more towards the front and then you need to re-secure it with the screws. Now if you have a large power supply it will be worth shifting that drive cage towards the front that will give you more space. Now for this build as I mentioned I'm using the air tower cooler which is this Noctua NHU12A Chromax Black. A small compact cooler with 220 millimeter fans on it that's really easy to install and should give good cooling performance. I'm going to do a video separately on this later on, but you can see it comes with a number of different parts included in it. I'm going to do a build guide fully on this to show you the different setups for Intel and AMD, but obviously with this is an Intel board with LGA 1700 socket. So I'm going to quickly show you the steps for that. So if you've got the same, you can easily do it. So it has a back plate included with it, which is actually capable of supporting multiple different socket types. But for LGA 1700, you'll see there are four diamond shaped corners to it. We need to make sure we extend the out to the full far corners of each of those with the standoff screws that we're going to go run through it. You also need to make sure you face it the right way around. You'll see it said this side faces the motherboard. So you need to make sure that will then fit on the back. So this is a back plate that goes on the back of the motherboard. So I'd recommend doing this before you install the motherboard because it will make your life easier. You can access all these things and you'll see that the screws have these little shapes to them basically notch into that little hole there and you need to push them out to the far corners. So these are standoff screws that will run through the motherboard holes and around the CPU and then you can seat the things down on top. There's these little clips that hold them in place that you have to push through there that kind of look like Pac-Man and then you just repeat that process for each of the four corners securing those standoff screws. Again, taking care to make sure that the caution markings are facing the right way so that we know it's going to be seated onto the motherboard. So once that's finished and it's all secured nicely, then this need to get our motherboard that we've already set up with everything else and install the bracket in the rear. So you're just lining up with the four holes on the rear of the motherboard and then pushing the standoffs through to the other side. This will allow us to install the cooler on top of that as well as some other parts in a second. But you can see how that secures down and it just threads through there pretty easily. So you just gotta make sure you push it through and then hold it where you flip your motherboard over so you can access the other side. You then have those four standoffs poking through in the four different corners. And you need to put these blue washers down over the top of each of those. So just slotting those down there 
and putting them into place. And what that does, it then secures those so you can then put the bracketing on top. So with this bracketing, you'll notice that's going to sit on top of these. We need to line it up with notch two, which is the middle notch for this socket of motherboard. It's going to vary depending on which one you're using. But if you're using a 1700 socket as I am, it goes notch two, which is the middle. You need to make sure both top and bottom like that and then there's some screws that then secure that bracketing down repeat the same process on the left hand side and screw those down as well and then that's nice and tight and readily to be used now noctua recommends putting a certain amount of thermal paste on there and multiple blobs i actually prefer to cover the entire heat spreader with thermal paste making sure you've got a thin covering just covering the entire thing and carefully then seat the cooler down over the top so the cooler itself so the tower sits down so that the screws on either side basically sit onto the bracketing we just installed you then need to screw it in with the tool that's included a couple of screws on each side until it gets nice and secured and then keep going until you can't tighten it anymore without over tightening so don't force it because if you do you may put too much pressure on there and then bend the pins on the motherboard where the cpu set up and that could obviously damage it then the fans then hook on to either side. So you need to make sure they're facing the right direction. So with the fan on the right hand side, for example, the blades face outwards towards the front of the case. So that means when the air is being pulled from those front three fans and the front of the case, it pulled into the case and then it gets sucked through the air tower, through the metal and then pulled out the rear. So the other fan that sits onto the rear does the same thing. It has some hooks on either side of this which then just clip on to the bracketing on the cooler itself, and then they're secured in place. Now with this cooler, you've got two cables coming off the fans. Those then connect up to a fan splitter cable, a Y splitter cable that's included with the Noctua cooler, and then that just connects up to the CPU fan header on your motherboard. Really straightforward installation process, and a great looking cooler that should give good cooling performance and easy to connect up. So you can see you CPU fan one, as the connector here and just plug that in and that will then make sure both fans spin on there once that's done we can then reseat the motherboard put it into the case line up the io at the rear and then just carefully and gently seat it down i did find that the fan cabling by the way got in the way for that rear fan when i initially put it in so watch out for that but carefully seat that down and then use those little screws that I showed you earlier on. So they're smaller screws that have a round head on them and secure those. There are nine screw holes for this ATX motherboard. So you'd need to secure three across the bottom, middle and top. And then the power supply unit then sits into the bottom of the case. Make sure the fan for it faces downwards because that will ensure that it can pull cold air into itself and then keep it cool. And then we're seating that in there. Now, this is a pretty compact power supply. If you have a large one, as I said, removing the hard disk drive cage might be beneficial. There are four screws included, which have a lot of hex design to them. Now, those come with both the power supply and with a case, so you have options on what to do. Now, once that's in, we can then wire up the extra cables. So, as I showed earlier on, the flat SATA power connectors for your hard disk drives and for your SSDs. We can put those into place now and that will obviously ensure that these are powered. Now they have an L-shaped connector on them. You can see I had to flip the cable around there so you've got to make sure that's set up properly. Don't forget while you're doing this you also need to plug in the power for that RGB controller. At the top of the case requires SATA power as well. You will notice that it does say unplug the power connector from it if you're not going to use that controller. So if you're going to use the 5 volt RGB header on your motherboard that I showed you earlier on, then you don't need the SATA power. But if you want to use the button on the top of the case to control the RGB, then you will need the power. Then we run those two 8-pin CPU power connectors through around the side here. You will find there are some cable tidying hooks around the edge of the case. That means you can secure things down a little bit. I'm not going to use too much of them because what I want to demonstrate is how much space there's left at the end to be able to close the door. But if you want to make things neat, there are various different channels that you can use there. Obviously, you've got the Velcro ties as well. We run the USB-A and USB-C connectors to the second part of the motherboard on the left-hand side there. And then the 24-pin power cable goes in the same place. So the top one and then we run that through and connect those up. 
So then you've got to seat that down into place. So make sure you push that down and that it clicks nicely into place and it's fully secured as well. That 24 pin one is really important. Again, the USB-A connector has a little notch on it, so you can only plug it in one way round. And the USB-C might not be obvious, but that actually will only plug in one way round as well. So you need to make sure you plug it in in a way that where it will click into place. I need to hear a little click. Then don't forget the two 8-pin CPU power connectors. I will say I found these quite fiddly to do after installing the air tower. So it's something to bear in mind. You might find it a little bit tricky to get those connected up. Then don't forget the system fan header power connection. So that's from the daisy chain fan. So the three fans on the front of the case and the one at the rear. That will then need to run to your motherboard. In this instance, I'm using the top right because there's a system fan header there. You can see Mark Six Fan 6. You may have other connectors at the bottom of the case you want to use instead. And bottom of the motherboard and you can connect those up. But here it's at the top. You have options as long as it's a four pin power connector. That will work. And then obviously don't forget the power switch and hard disk drive LED connectors that I showed you earlier on. Plug in in the bottom right. Make sure they're connected up. If they're not, then you won't be able to power the case on with that power button on top. And then the USB connection for your front panel connector needs to go in there as well as the HD audio over the 3.5 millimeter jack on top of the case as well if you plan on using that you need to plug that in the bottom left then don't forget your data cables for your drives now quick note actually i wouldn't recommend plugging these in just yet because i want to show you another issue potentially you're going to have if you're planning on using that anti-sag bracket because you notice how close that is to those cables pay attention to that i want to show you why that's a problem in a second that i encountered and i'm going to show you so hopefully you don't have the same problem when you're going about your build so now I'm just testing to make sure everything's working properly. So I quickly powered it on without the graphics card just to make sure the fans are all spinning as they should be, both on the air tower and on the case. Now I'm installing the GPU, so I remove two of those brackets at the rear and then seat your GPU down, taking care when pushing it in, make sure it clicks in. And then you need to use the screws that you took off from those brackets to re-secure the graphics card to the back of the case. Now you can see the anti-sag bracket and where that sits. You can see with this GPU, it's not quite making contact with it at the moment. But if you look at the rear of the case, you'll just find two screws here, which you need a screwdriver to loosen a little bit. And then you can adjust where that bracket sits. You can see you can move it up a bit or down, depending on the size of your graphics card. And you can then position it so that it will then support the GPU as it's meant to. So what I found now is unfortunately I can't get it all the way up because the cables from the drives that I mentioned a second ago are in the way. So now what I have to do is to remove the GPU again, then change the position of where I've plugged in those hard disk drive SSD cables and then move that mounting bracket. Now this is obviously going to be a pain and it may vary from build to build depending on your setup but you can see it actually it's going to get in the way of a few of those ports. So if you've got loads of hard disk drives and SSDs that might potentially be a problem. But I plugged them in on the lower port and then I was able to reseat the graphics card and then I could reposition the anti-sag bracket. Now I will say it's handy to have this especially if you've got one of the larger, heavier graphics cards. It's a nice inclusion and you can use it quite easily. The other thing you'll notice is there's actually a slot on the right hand side where you could take that whole thing out and move it further over. So if you've got a really long GPU, you could even do that. Plug the graphics card in with the cables that run from the front bottom port that I showed you earlier. And then we've got it set up. So this is a standard setup, pretty basic install with the air tower obviously i've not added in any additional case fans you do have the option of adding some 120 mil or 140 millimeter fans on the top of the case i could put those two 120 millimeter fans below the graphics card as well again placing those face down so that they then suck air from the bottom and blow it up onto the graphics card they'd need to plug into the system fan headers so that they'd then be powered and then screwed in. Now I've done this the wrong way around as well. So again, pay attention to the way I do things so that you don't miss out on this sort of information. But what I found was once the graphics card installed, you can't actually install the fans properly because you obviously can't reach the rear fan screws. So you can put in two of the front ones on both fans, but then you can't put the extra ones in at the back because you can't actually screw them in unless you had a tiny screwdriver 
the graphics card's going to be in the way. So install these fans first if you're planning on doing that before you put your GPU in, and that'll make life easier for then connecting those up. But that's another option. Now, it is a little bit louder with this, and as I said, I don't know what the performance would be like because one of the fans is probably being blocked by the power supply, but it might help with a bit of extra airflow being sucked from the bottom. Obviously, with the front 140 millimeter fans, the bottom one of that is blowing onto the hard drive, but also into that general space down the bottom, and then it could be sucked up by those bottom mounted fans and blown directly onto the graphics card. With everything wired properly, you should then be able to change the RGB lighting by just pressing that button on top, as I showed you, pretty straightforward. Now, another option, this is an additional purchase, but this is a Lian Li vertical GPU mount, which is a Gen 4 one that will easily plug in and set up so you can put your graphics card into that instead then you wire that into that same port on the top of the motherboard so the x16 slot and then you basically just secure this vertical mounting bracket in there you can see it sits quite far back in the case so it is perfect for this build because it won't be too close close to the glass and you can run the cables from the rear and kind of keep them neat still this is an additional purchase, but I wanted to show it was possible to do if you want to. So you can vertically mount your graphics card, and it certainly does look a lot nicer actually like this, especially if you've got a nice looking graphics card that suits the theme of the build and see the way it sits, and then the overall finish there. Now with the glass back on in a second, you'll see it's a little bit hidden, but a nice setup. Now one problem I did have, as I mentioned earlier on, is with the display. I'm gonna revisit this, but my display isn't working because one of the cables from the USB cable has actually come loose. I need to fix it, and then I'm going to do that separately. But hopefully you should find that display's working, and then you can download the software to control it and get information on that. But otherwise, that's the complete build. And as you can see, despite no cable tidying at the rear, I can get the door back on. It doesn't bulge out, and it just slots into place nicely. And that's perfect. That's the perfect solution here. The reason I do that is to demonstrate that you can shut it if you're messy like me. And I personally will be taking this build apart at some point in the near future to build in a different case because I'm just demonstrating it in different builds so I often have to reuse parts. Don't forget to peel the plastic covering off the glass on that door. I do it off the case to make sure you don't cause any problems with shorts. But for fanciness, I'm going to take a risk and peel it off for you now. And then you get the final view. Now you can see what I was talking about with the GPU being slightly hidden. It kind of looks like it's peeking over the top of that door. You've got some nice venting there as well. So you should get good airflow going in. And the final result is a pretty nice looking case. If you found this video useful, please drop me a comment down below to let me know. Subscribe if you haven't already. And check out the links in the description to find out more. Thanks very much for watching.